uh, those of you who have been with us the past weeks who are still with us, uh, this communicates a lot of uh, comfort to us from you members that uh, you are pretty interested in uh, seeing yourselves grow in as far as uh, professional involvement is concerned. Uh, today, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be taking you through uh, this session. My name is Charles, a CPA Charles Mutimba, Manager uh, Standards and Technical Support at the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda. I uh, will be joined with our panelists, uh, CPA Sarah Chedengat and uh, CPA Martin uh, Makumbi, who will be sharing with us a lot uh, as far as uh, tax updates in this era of uh, COVID uh, crisis. Uh, as a way of just setting the scene, uh, probably members uh, who are listening in, members who are watching us, you need to note that uh, a lot has been uh, taking place uh, right from when this uh, pandemic uh, attacked the entire world. Uh, you will note that uh, a number of nations took on what we call a strict measures as a way of curbing the spread of uh, the pandemic. But among these measures were those that were aimed at uh, restricting uh, big gatherings or great gatherings and automatically keeping social distance. Uh, from what is happening and what is uh, being reported currently, we see that uh, the healthy curve, as far as the pandemic is concerned, is now uh, flattening, uh, trying to show that uh, there are reduced incidences of uh, spread of the, the disease, especially with the nations that have adopted those uh, strain, strain and strict measures. But as the healthy curve flattens, we see the economic curve uh, deepening, and this simply communicates uh, great and great uh, concern when it gets to recessions, depressions, and the like. Our budget has just been uh, discussed, passed, uh, tax proposals have been passed by parliament. We are here to discuss that. You are aware budget has to do with the expenditures, has to do with the, with the incomes. You note that uh, we've been uh, informed, the budget has uh, been increased to over 12.3% uh, this year uh, uh, from where it was to a tune of over 45.5 trillion. When the budget increases, it simply shows that uh, the government intends to collect more money, but also spend more money. Uh, from the collection bit, we see it is estimated that over 72 percent is going to be collected from domestic uh, domestic sources what we are trying to look at now is uh, in the current pandemic will this be an achievable uh, target our experts are going to take us through all this they'll share with us the different uh, budget allotments how much has for example the ministry of health been uh, allotted uh, particularly it would be of our concern in this uh, era, given the fact that it's uh, highly at uh, the forefront. But before we get into the discussions, we shall be guided by uh, some ground rules. One, I will encourage members who have questions to use the Q&A uh, platform. Uh, we are trying to limit on the chat because the chat always has a number of messages. With the Q&A, we shall specifically be looking at uh, questions and uh, we shall be, we shall endeavor to respond to them. I thank those who have already submitted their questions. We have uh, compiled them here and we're going to discuss them. And uh, in case any of your questions are not answered, we are, as the Institute, we are developing a, a frequently frequently ask questions in this uh, COVID era, and we shall be updating you on, on that. I also wish that any member who wishes to ask, there is a, a tab, when you, click at, uh, when you click at the participants section, you will see a raise up, raise hand. If you have any question, when we get into the question, uh, period, please feel free to 
raise up your hand and if you are picked on we request that you are brief such that we have a, a rich discussion over these matters we shall share the slides in due course once we are done and also um, any any further information that you may need I also wish to use this opportunity to alert you uh, and inform you about our COVID menu on the, on the ICPAU website. We encourage you to visit that resource. It has a lot of uh, information that uh, you, may, you may need to address your mind to. Among the, the, the resources there, the Institute a through automatically participation of you members compiled what we call the policy proposals to the government of Uganda. And uh, it was simply uh, giving a detail and proposals on how, on the strategies on how the government may revive the economy from disruptions that are caused by this pandemic. And ladies and uh, gentlemen, we shall have our first panelist, Sarah will take us through the updates of uh, tax updates. And uh, after Sarah, a CPA, Martin Makumbi, will get in to uh, discuss uh, issues of budget. We see what tax uh, stimulus has been uh, introduced, let's say, with our, within our neighborhood, what tax stimulus are available within our our, our budget for the period 2020-2021. Uh, Sarah is a director of tax at Ernest and Young. Uh, she has over 10 years of uh, experience, particularly in tax. She has served a lot on a number of uh, committees of the Institute, uh, particularly the tax and economic policy uh, panel of the Professional Standards Committee. Uh, she's a member of the Institute. And uh, Sarah, we, 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 we thank you greatly for your contributions all the time. We call upon you whenever it comes to matters of tax policy. Uh, Martin will, will, will come in, CPO Martin Makumbi, manager at uh, manager tax at Deloitte. Uh, Martin also has over 10 years of uh, tax experience and uh, has been so handy whenever uh, the Institute is uh, assembling tax commentary or tax policy recommendations to the government. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, taking much of uh, the time, allow me invite uh, CPA Sarah Cherengat to take us through the tax updates. Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Charles, and good afternoon to all CPS. I'm sure there are other people who may not be CPS but have interest in tax. <coughs> tax matters because tax affects every person, uh, every, every national, and every other person who really consumes. Um, we, I trust that you are all fine and specifically wish to thank the ICPAU leadership for giving me this opportunity to share with the, the team. This is a really unprecedented times, and now all imperial royal with, the, with that fiscal touch, but things now are going to be what? Uh, we, we are not doing it remotely, but uh, we embrace this technology, digital technology, and uh, this should be Fine. So today we, we want to catch up with the budget. We, you, you've noticed that Parliament finished discussing the tax amendments and the budget in its entirety. But specifically today, we are looking at the tax aspects of the budget and how it will impact us at both our personal levels and at, at even our businesses. Uh, because of the current pandemic, you will note that the tax amendments are not a lot. They, they have really been very, and even the, the few that are there are not really very, very aggressive. Uh, you will note that 
in this presentation, there will be a difference between what was initially in the, in the social media and maybe in the dailies, because you will note that the parliamentarians had to drop a number of proposals that had been laid. So uh, as, we, as we start, we, I will present, then I will get questions at the end. We already have questions that were sent to ICPAU uh, and we are, we've received them. We will also project those questions after this presentation and then we will be able to, to, to answer them. My colleague uh, Martin Makumbi will join me after 30 minutes and he's going to talk about the tax proposals of Kenya. We were not able to get the ones for Tanzania, but uh, we are sure that when we finally come to the actual tax bills, uh, which have been assented to, when they read the budget in June, we will be running you through the East African budgets and you will be able to appreciate uh, the analysis and how the different states of the East African community have been able to lay down their budgets and specifically even be able to do comparative analysis and appreciate what other states have done differently from Uganda. So for now, I will handle the Ugandan tax amendments, which are supposed to be going to the president. And we expect that in the next three or four weeks, they should be passed into law. And then we will be back again in June during the budget to discuss the same. Thank you very much. So um, I, I hope you are all able to view the slides. Uh, we are just going to start. And the, in the next slide, we look at, uh, I don't know whether, yeah. In my executive summary, uh, on the 31st of March, 2020, the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development tabled the tax amendment bills in parliament for debate. And you will note that following the debate, some bills were dropped, others were retained. And there was some amendments in others. These bills, if passed into law, will be effective 1st July, 2020. Key proposals are in the amendment bills for income tax, VAT, excise duty, and stamp duty. Normally, customs comes later uh, because you note that we are governed by the East African Customs Act and most of the customs amendments are really agreed at ESC level. So we are going to look at these four bills and these four different types of laws. We start with the income tax amendment bill. The next slide is the income tax amendment bill. And uh, next. Yeah, the first amendment or proposal is uh, to exempt income of the deposit protection fund. You note that this fund has been established there was an ED that was recruited, that was recruited, and uh, there was, uh, the, the, the fund actually is already running. So they are just exempting this institution, income tax, like any other government institution. And uh, that is really, that is it. The other one is the income tax exemption for investors. If you note, most of the amendments have been talking about exemption for investors for the past three years running. And every other year, government really tries to, 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 to do proposals, to do consultations on how best to involve Ugandans in these exemptions. In the past, you will note that governments were more on the foreign investments. But now we realize most Ugandans have really come on board and they are investing in different sectors of the economy. So uh, specifically, hello? Hello? We can hear you, Sarah. Okay, fine. Uh, so we were saying 
who are saying that the proposal is to look at industries like agro processing, look at industries like uh, furniture, uh, basically value add within Uganda. If you are in furniture, but maybe that would also fall under agro processing or any form of industrial activity that would add value to, to Uganda's uh, industry sector. So um, what is very good in this amendment is that initially they had capped the investments for citizens at 1 million, but now they have reduced the, vol the, the turnover to, sorry, the investment capital to 300 million. And uh, if you go further to up country, it is 150 million, which is about 500 million Uganda shillings, quite fair. And then the 300 million will be about a billion. So your income will be exempted for tax, but there are conditions to that effect. You must, you must be able to at least employ 70% of Ugandans, and those 70% must also represent 70% of your wage bill. They are trying to avoid a situation where Ugandans are the, 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 the casual laborers who work in the factory and then the middle level management and senior staff are expatriates. Uh, so that is really important and it, it, it's a good amendment for all of us. The foreign investor takes uh, $10 million, which is okay, they are really, we, we expect that if you are coming to invest here, then you must be able to bring in serious capital. So uh, in this amendment, they are looking at uh, manufacturers of tires, footwear, mattresses, tooth, toothpastes, just being added into another long list, which was there in 2019 and 2018. And then there are also clarification still on this. They are talking of uh, the possibility for a client. For example, if I was already existing and I am now in agro processing, if my investment capital meets the condition, then what the law is saying is that my income relating from relating to this special investment will be exempted. Will be exempted. So that is the thing. And then they have also given us how best we can be able to 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 segment this and and be able to declare the tax separately. So you can be able to have. 70% of your income taxable, and then the 30 is exempt because it, 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 it meets this condition for the additional investment. Uh, there is a difference between additional investment and investment. Investment would ideally be looking at new investors coming to invest, but additional would be a company that was already in the system, but now wants to take advantage of this exemption, so puts 300, million of that investment in an upcountry location to start doing maybe agro processing. So that exempts the organization. Uh, the next, so that is really on this and you will notice later that uh, this exemption covers all the other amendments. It will also be talked about in VAT, it will be talked about in stamp duty and excise duty. It, it's, it's really good because it will promote industrialization and that is exactly what Uganda needs to stabilize the economy, specifically in these COVID times. So in the next slide, we are looking at uh, still income tax amendments. The, the, the law is saying there will be an allowable deduction for purchase of expenses from a supplier designed to use invoicing. You will note that uh, electronic and they are already being used. So this amendment takes care of that, that if you are going to do e-invoicing, then the tax authority is going to allow those e-invoicing uh, as, as valid invoices. 
and then will be allowed for income tax deduction. But however, they are saying that suppliers will be gazetted and these expenses should be supported. Uh, yeah, you should be able to give support as in details of what was provided for uh, in the e-invoices or e-receipts. Then the other amendment that comes on board is on insurance agents. This has been a gray area because uh, the, the difference between uh, specifically in insurance, we have the agents or brokers, but we have what we call the premiums. If I'm an insurance broker and I get a client for the insurance company, I will be paid the premium and also my commission. The premium is not money for the agent or broker. That one goes into the insurance company because they are just picking it and transferring it to the insurance company. What is their income is commission. So what the law is saying is that earned by agents and it will be a 10% withholding tax. So this is a clarification and this is what insurance companies now should be able to do for agents and brokers. Normally brokers could, should be the companies and agents could be individuals. Uh, we shall still proceed with the uh, more amendments to the next slide. We don't tax on commissions to an advertising agent. Similar to, similar to the insurance commissions, if you are now giving a commission to an advertising agent, you will have to withhold. All these amendments will be effective first July and it is also at 10%. So, uh, a person who makes a commission payment to an advertising agent will have to withhold on the gross amount at a rate of 10 percent. There is also an amendment on tax clearing certificates for transport services and uh, this is mainly for trucks and passenger trunk services. This, this provision used to be there some years back but it's being reintroduced. They would want you when you are renewing your license, you have to first get a tax clearance from URA for that particular truck. It's just a way of widening the tax base and uh, really making sure that each one pays a fair share of the tax. Uh, next, still on income tax amendment. Withholding tax returns by withholding tax agents. This is just a clarification, but we already knew that withholding tax was due by the 15th day of every month. Uh, so it's, it's just a clarification of the law and uh, to make it clear that if you are going to withhold tax, then you have to pay by the 15th. And they, they refer to the various provisions of the law, right from section 83 to section 87. So. Those, those provisions, withholding tax on payments to non-residents, ETC, when you withhold, you pay by the 15th day of the following month. And then the other interesting exemption is uh, exempting income of Islamic Development Bank. You will appreciate, ladies and gentlemen, that Islamic financing has already been embraced in the country. And uh, if you look at the way the Islamic finance or the Islamic laws uh, do their business, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Now the government has decided to exempt the income of the bank. Actually, it has been listed in Schedule 1, meaning that its income will be exempted. And you will note later on when we come to the VAT amendments that it is also exempt for VAT purposes. It's in Schedule 1 and will be entitled to get VAT funds on its supplies. Uh, still on income tax amendment bill, government is to focus on the informal sector. 
deciding to focus on the informal sector and the uh, introduction of new tax regimes for small businesses. And uh, we have been having this small business taxpayer regime. Uh, Sarah, we seem to to have lost you. Oh, perfect. hello. I'm yes, back. Sure. Yeah, so we, we are saying that initially, government was uh, already already had a regime for taxation of the informal sector, what we refer to as the presumptive tax regime. Now there are amendments to this regime, and uh, they they are specifically looking at uh, those without records and those without records. You can be informal, but you are able to keep some minimal records. And uh, specifically, what you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, that if your turnover is less than 10 million, you are not supposed to pay tax. But if it is more, then you pay tax. But so this presumptive regime is for turnover more than 10 million, but less than 150 million. So uh, we look at uh, the first bracket. If you earn more than 10 million, but less than 30 million, if you do not have records, you will pay tax per year of 80,000. But if you have records, they will tax you 0.4% of your turnover. The turnover should be in excess of 10 million. Remember the 10 million is exempted. It's interesting because it was coming from 1.5%. Now I think it has been reduced and it is better for the informal sector. And then uh, the next slide still looks at the, 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 the band between 30 million and uh, 30 million and uh, 50 million. And the, the tax is. Um, with the, without records, 200,000. With the records, 0 0.5 in excess of 30 million. So the difference between 30 million and 50. And then the next, the next one is uh, where gross turnover exceeds 50 million, but does not exceed 80 million. You pay a flat fee of 400,000 if you do not have records, or if you have records, it's 180 or 0 0.6 of the turnover in excess of 50 million. So the next one is for turnover between 80 million and 150 million. Remember we said that uh, if your turnover is uh, more than 150, you are expected to, to, to keep records and prepare financial statements and employ a CPA to assist you to prepare financial statements. But if it's less than 150, you can keep informal, but this is how the tax regime plays. So if your turnover is in excess of 80 million, but does not exceed 150, if you do not have records, you will be paying 100,000 Uganda shillings. With the records, you will, you will pay 300, and 60,000 plus 0.5 percent of the turnover in excess of 80. We are looking at 80 and 150. So uh, that that is what it takes. You know, when they when they assess you presumptively, it means that you can't even prepare a tax return. You can just uh, you are able to just tell the taxman that I think I earn about this. But uh, I'm thinking that accountants can still support people in the informal sector. There are so many people whose turnover is more than 150 who need to just pay the right tax and not to, to be estimated. So that is the income tax amendment bills. From this discussion of the income tax bills, we note that uh, there were a number of proposals that were dropped. If you recall, there were a number of proposals that were covering rental tax, there was even a proposal to exempt private schools. There was a proposal to tax businesses that have been loss making and declaring losses over a period 
period of time, all those were dropped, and I think it was better that way. So let's look at the VAT Amendment Act. The next slide. Now, VAT Amendment Acts are quite condensed, and uh, there are just a few of them which are interesting. One is on the manufacturers. If you are going to do manufacturing, remember we already talked about the infrastructuring, agro processing, ETC. If you are going to do manufacturing, government is saying they will give you a deduction or you will be given to claim input tax incurred within a year. Any input tax incurred within a year will be creditable. Currently, what happens is that you can only claim input tax if it was incurred six months before related to capital goods and stock of goods, stock yeah, inventory in, at hand. Six months, purchase six months before registration. But now they are saying as long as you incur that input tax before one year, you can be able to claim if you are in manufacturing. Very good for the manufacturing entities. It's for suppliers designated to use e-tax, e-invoices and e-receipts. This is already what we said. The, in the income tax side, we are giving you a deduction. And then for VAT, they are also giving you a credit for those e-tax invoices as long as as long as you are able to support this this is very good and the beauty with these e-tax invoices is that the tax authority can also be able to to view them and it's it's quite easy for them to audit the other one is the islamic development bank being included among the listed public international organizations in the vat act if you are in Schedule 1, you are normally exempted for VAT, but the difference is that you will be allowed to claim VAT in card on, on, on purchases for the business. So we shall expect the Islamic Development Bank to be claiming input tax in card on various supplies. That is the difference. And this is really very good because it's akin to zero rating a supply and it makes the cost of business low. The other proposals on the VAT Amendment Act or bill is basically exemptions. The exempt list is already very long and they've continued to, to increase it or widen it further. Uh, fellow APS, what is the, di the difference between VAT exemption and zero rating is that if a supply is exempt for VAT, the cost of business becomes higher simply because an ex a supplier who is exempt is not able to claim input tax incurred in purchases. But if you are zero rated, or if a supply is zero rated, it means that any purchases incurred to, to, to incur that zero rate supply will be claimable. So what, what happens is that when you exempt, it's okay, but this person will also incur VAT in other supplies, maybe VAT on rent, electricity, water, and they will not be able to claim. So these expenses that are not been that are not claimable will be part of the cost of business and it will make the cost of business higher. So you will find that these same items that government is really exempting continue to be more expensive as uh, uh, and yet it would so this is something that government really needs to consider. If agriculture is the backbone of Uganda's economy, we would rather have this zero rated so that the traders in these different suppliers are able to claim VAT on, on these supplies and it will make the cost of their business lower. So uh, just back to the list, trailers for agricultural purposes, combined harvesters, tractor mounted hay mowers, slashers, regs, tenders, crop sprayers. The list is really long, but we are looking at mainly the agricultural sector. 
drinkers, feeders, tuba harvesting machinery, etc. All those are going to be exempted. In the next slide, we see we see more additional we see more additional list of exempt supplies, uh, supply of services to conduct visibility study on uh, locally produced raw materials, construction of a factory, etc. Inputs for equipment to an operator carrying on the listed businesses. So all this, if you are going to do a feasibility study, then that service will be exempt. Supply of cotton seed cake is also exempt. We also see the following additional exempt supplies, software and equipment installation services to manufacture, agricultural products, and then, uh, yeah, uh, if you are going to import software, not, not agriculture, but for manufacturers, sorry, for manufacturers, whatever I'm importing, if it is software and equipment installation services, those will be exempt from VAT. And then services incidental to telemedical services. Remember, medical services are already exempted, but uh, you will note that with, the, with the, this COVID pandemic, there will be a lot of telemedical services and that will be also incidental to medical services and they will be exempt. Royalties paid in respect of agricultural technologies is exempt. The supply of accommodation in tourist hotels and lodges located up country. This, this exemption was there in the past years and it has come back. I think it's good for the tourism sector because it has really been worst hit by this pandemic. That, that is really a welcome a welcome to the government to have considered that. Supply of gas, 18% is off. Like I was saying, exempting it will not really give you a full benefit of the 18 that you are paying of totally. Supply of processed milk will also be exempt. Supply of locally developed computer software, its maintenance. They are trying to really develop a local talent. If we can have our IT gurus do work here, then their, their technology will be exempt. That is a good, that's a good one, a plus. And then uh, we are also, this, I think this one is uh, supply to conduct feasibility studies. It is uh, listing all these others, construction of premises, infrastructure, machinery and equipment, ETC, and the, the list is there. So it will be exempt from VAT and they, they, they give conditions and the, the investment capital should not be less than a million dollars. So you should not just be doing for any other business, but it should be a serious business that will bring uh, some revenue to the economy. Let's go to the next. <coughs> Excise duty amendment bill. We must be not doing very well on time. Uh, we have a number of excise duty amendment bills, uh, sorry, excise duty amendments that are in place. The, the common ones, every year they look at male spirit per liter. This is a spirits and the nature spirit. It's made from local produced raw materials. If the proportion is 1,500 per liter, whichever is higher, but it, it is being reduced from a higher figure. And then uh, we are also looking at uh, reducing duty rates for fruit and vegetables, uh, except juice, juices. And uh, this is again to promote the processing. So uh, this will be okay. <coughs> People are saying they are not getting me well um, echoey. Is it better now? Hello? Yes, I, uh, Peter, 
uh, probably Peter help us that side. But our speaking here is just, I think, uh, connection issues. Okay. Uh, just and then uh, it's okay. We can proceed. Then uh, we are looking at uh, excise duty on on petrol. As usual, there is always a, an increment from 1,350 from the 1,200. So gas, 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 oil, these are all petrol, diesel, etc. Moving from a small, day. there is always an addition of 100 or 200 every year on that. And I think it's not, a, <coughs> it's not a, a new thing. Uh, sacks and bags of polymers, plastics, those ones are also being exempted from uh, excise duty. I think it is, it is uh, going to make it cheaper. And then uh, if you are going to manufacture sanitary pads, if you are going to manufacture sacks and bags, and then ETC, there is going to be also some excise duty. excise duty uh, exemptions. Panelists are saying I'm not clear. I don't know what could happen. Peter, are we okay? We are Let's good. go to the next. People are saying they didn't get VAT, but we shall be able to share the slides. We, we are sorry for the bad reception. I don't know. It's now okay. It's now okay. Yeah, earlier there's a slide in which it was put in off, oh, but now it's fine. Yeah, so we are looking at uh, a number of exemptions for excise duty for a number of businesses. Like they are saying, nil excise duty for construction materials of a factory or warehouse, for those available on the local market or locally produced raw materials. And again, there are conditions that have to be met for that, like right, we had said $10 million if you are non-citizen and 300 million if you are a citizen and then $150,000 $150, if you are investing in upcountry. Ladies and gentlemen, what I would pick from these amendments is that government is looking at investors being able to locate their businesses outside Uganda, outside Kampala, and they are able to get uh, uh, capital allowances, like initial allowance. If you locate your business at a radius of 50 kilometers outside Kampala, you are able to get a 50% on the plant and machinery that you, you use as capital allowance on top of all the other capital allowances. So even now you look at the way government is doing, they want to de Kampala and be able to create other cities that people should really be able to, to locate. Now you will note that electricity is not an issue. So I think it is mainly an infrastructure government has invested a lot in roads. So they are looking at Additional businesses, like for example, if you are going to invest in tires, footwear, mattresses, toothpaste, all these will have excise duty exempted. So they, they have listed the strategic businesses that should, should enjoy this. But again, the conditions apply. We are talking of the ability for these businesses to employ 70% of Ugandans and also be able to ensure present 70% of the wage bill, that the Ugandans that you are going to employ are really gainfully employed and not doing just the other small, small jobs that would have been done by people really who, who are not very well educated. Next slide. So those are mainly the key amendments and you will look at the still this on still on on stamp duty it is still on the same line you will note again that depending on the volume of the capital there are exemptions that come with that investment
So we look at the stamp duty amendments. I don't know if people are still able to get me. You, yeah, you somebody is clear. asking. For purposes of the act, it was defined that a citizen includes a citizen of East African community. So it's not only a Ugandan citizen, but a citizen of East African community. That is true. The bill proposes to amend Schedule 2 of the Principal Act to exempt stamp duty on debentures and loan related payments. Duty was formerly 0.5% of the value. This is really good because it was making the cost of loans quite high. I'm sure most of the banking institutions will be welcoming this and it's, it's really important. So you will see that there will be exemption on stamp duty on equitable mortgage. There will be exemption on any instruments imposing further charge on mortgage property. So basically duties relating to mortgages of property are all being exempted. To exempt stamp duty on any loan, very, very good. Remember, you would have to pay stamp duty, pay insurance, pay loan processing fee. By the time you get the actual loan, the, the processing fees are quite a lot. So this is a relief for the taxman, for the taxpayers, and we appreciate government for that. To exempt stamp duty in respect of any instrument ex executed in, re in regard to a strategic project by an operator. Again, this was already in the previous years, but they are just trying to ex clarify. If you are going to invest $10 million, or for the case of a citizen, $300 million or $150 million, what they are saying is that there will be stamp duty exemption on various instruments such as transfer of land, mortgages, debentures for, for taxpayers who have done these investments. I hope that is clear. Additional strategic investment projects ex executing dutable stamp duty from stamp duty to include tires, footwear, mattresses. They are just clarifying that again, to benefit from that, you must also be in the business of manufacturing Factor of tires, footwear, mattresses, etc. Again, the condition supply, 70% of Ugandans or citizens, as the case be. Remember, we said citizens are citizens of the East African community, or the bill should be 70% for citizens meaning that Ugandans should really be employed in proper positions. In, next. Imposing stamp duty on professional license and certificates of Uganda shillings, 100,000. This will interest many accountants and also other professionals. <coughs> uh, you will note that we normally, we normally apply for a trading license and uh, even, even when we get that license, we have to pay stamp duty. What I don't know is, are they talking of a license from KCCA or a license from a professional license? I think from ICPAU, you go ahead and pay stamp duty of 100,000. So uh, just look at the cost of the ICPAU license as going up by 100,000 that goes to the tax man. That is what it means. And it will affect professionals. Professionals are accountants, lawyers, doctors, engineers, ETC, all people who are in that professional cycle. Remember the word professional is also defined in the act and there is a, a regulation that gives us a definition or a clarity on that. <clears throat> I will specifically just be very brief on highlights on uh, business continuity measures, which have been pronounced by the tax authority for this period of COVID. You will note that uh, able to get extension of tax filings for April and March, they were pushed by another 15 days. The, the, those which were due by 15th March were pushed to 30th, 31st of March. 
and then those that were due by 15th April were pushed to 30th of April. We also saw the income tax returns that were due 31st of March being pushed by two months to now be due by 31st of, uh, of May. Uh, we also noted that the tax authority has been very flexible on allowing payment by installments. But again, you will note that as you pay in installments, let payment interest will still accrue in the system. So as much as you may be paying in installments, there is also a cost that will be hidden. You have to provide for the 2% per month interest. As Sarah, we seem to have lost you. Sarah, we did not pick that. I don't know what has. There was given between March and April, and they would exempt us, uh, were, were able to take our pronounced e repeat. I, I was actually on the last slide of uh, tax measures on business continuity measures by Uganda Revenue Authority with respect to COVID-19. Am I clear now? Sure, perfect. Okay, wow. so we said that URA went ahead and announced the number of measures. One was extension of tax filing dates for the month of, uh, for those that were due in March and April by another 15 days. So those were, which were due by 15th March, were given up to 31st March. Both due by 15th April were given up to 30th of April. And then there was also some flexibility on installment payment arrangements. Grant and I was saying that as much as this was granted, the 2% and so taxpayers needed to plan for that. Voluntary disclosure was also given and with the remission of penalties and interest. You had to be given a relief of interest and penalty if you did voluntary disclosure. A number of taxpayers did that and have benefited, but uh, we expected the tax authority to extend this for May and, and uh, June, but we haven't really seen it, but I we, because of the fact that these are very difficult times for taxpayers, it would have been very good if this was extended. They have talked of provision of online services. You can now be able to engage the tax authority online, submit whatever information online, and then they can still be able to respond to you online. So uh, this, this, this has been very helpful. The rest really just relates to how they want to maintain the, 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 the businesses to keep running in spite of the pandemic. All the border points are still remain open, but equipment, personal protection equipment. For accountants, I think PPE, PPE is different for us, but for the medical people, it means personal protection equipment. Uh -huh. Then management of cargo trucks, goods and logistics. Remember, we were, we were already talking of the tax clearing certificates for these trucks, which they must get, it's already there. Then they have also announced uh, fast tracking tax refunds. If you are able to provide information, they should be able to fast track the refunds so that taxpayers really are able to utilize this money in these difficult situations. So basically, the, the due dates were, in, were extended for those that were due 31st March to 31st May. And uh, we have not seen any other proposal come forth. I think I'm really running out of 
time. I don't know. We could do stop there and Martin comes. I don't sure. Maybe let uh, Peter uh, tell us what to do next. Uh, sure, Sarah, we, we could stop there uh, because the number of the business continuity measures that may have been there have been raised by some people here. You will probably have a chance to talk about them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we thank Sarah for that presentation. Allow me at this moment to call on Martin, uh, CPA Martin Makumbi. Uh, Martin, I already introduced you. Martin is a manager tax at Deloitte. As of uh, 11 years of uh, tax experience and he has been so handy in as far as uh, tax policy, uh, commentary, recommendations that the institute always shares with the government. Uh, Martin, uh, kindly take us through uh, what is happening elsewhere in East Africa as far as uh, budgeting, uh, tax proposals, and COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles. If you don't mind, uh, I'll just use the audio, but I hope I'm loud and clear. Sure. Um, yeah, greetings to everyone who is uh, attending this. Now, as uh, the practice is, usually around this period, we're in a period where, as a region, they are doing budget proposals and they are doing uh, amendments and whatever it is. However, as of today, so far, it's only Uganda and Kenya which have gone through with this. So for Rwanda and Tanzania, we don't have the updates yet. So what I'll run through are basically the updates from Kenya. And as of today, these are proposed bills are now law. The act was passed. So briefly, I'll look at uh, the key changes. And uh, overall, there's been a reduction that is in Kenya, a reduction of income tax rates for both individuals and corporate entities. There's been a reduction and elimination of incentives such as uh, investment allowances and exemptions. Then uh, in terms of withholding tax, there has been some other measures aimed at taxing income of non-residents. And then of course, uh, like it is in Uganda, and then reduction of uh, all changes in the exemption regime. As far as uh, corporation tax is concerned, the key highlights uh, the following. One, there has been a reduction in the rate of corporation tax. Currently, it has been at a rate of 30%, but as we talk now, it has been amended to 25%. And of course, when you compare that one to Uganda, Uganda, we are still at 30%. And you can uh, envisage the benefits of this. If uh, the taxman takes less, of course, you have more at your disposal. Then the other change has been, uh, they have repealed the preferential tax rates applicable to newly listed entities. Previously, there used to be like a sliding rate whereby depending on the years of listing from five to three, 27. So this sliding rate has been repealed and now there is a uniform rate of 25%. Then the other change also involved involves the the, the one of uh, the corporate rate for companies operating recycling plants. These also had uh, a preferential rate, and this came through in 2019, where the rate was 15% for the first five years. It put in place. This has been repealed. They'll also be taxed at 25%. Then the other change that was also come through were also to streamline the rates for companies operating under the special operating framework. 
they used to have different rates, but all this has been done away with. They also have a flat rate of 25%. And there used to be a rebate for those who are in manufacturing, where they used to have a deduction of an extra 30% of their electricity cost, but now this has been, um, has been repealed. So you can uh, relate with the people in manufacturing then. So potentially what you are seeing is an increase in the, in the cost of goods manufactured. Then there's been also an overhaul of the allowances to do with the capital expenditure. That is the capital allowances, which we at times call wear and tear or depreciation allowance across board to do with the uh, hotel buildings, to do with the uh, hospitals, to do with the uh, gas and storage facilities, education, commercial buildings, machinery, ships, aircraft. All of these, there's been an overhaul of the, the rates for the capital allowances. And overall, all of them have been reduced because you'd find at some point there was a 100% allowance at some point there was 150 percent allowance and most of these have gone to 50 percent and 25 percent that is uh, the initial allowance whereby now we have a uh, 50 percent and 25 percent on a reducing balance for the balance which remains so of course you can see in terms of corporate tax it's all aimed at now having more taxable income which of course is geared towards having more collections. Still with corporation tax, there's been a removal of income tax exemptions for most of the, the uh, institutions, and in particular boards and parasitals. There's a whole list of, of these, like the T, the T Board of Kenya, the Pyrethrum Board, Kenya Diary Board, Kenning Crops Board, all these, they have been now they were, they were exempt previously, but now they are not exempt anymore, meaning they are now taxable. Briefly, that is, oh, those are the changes that relate to corporate income tax from Kenya. And as indicated during my introduction, this is law now, it's no longer a bill, the act was passed. Then with regard to personal income tax, there's been some changes. One of them has been uh, the scope of qualifying in, qualifying interest uh, was expanded. Previously, there were different preferential rates applicable to interest and some exemptions with regard to interest earned by individuals. But now, what interest and the, the tax that is applicable is a final tax and this is a withholding tax. Then the other change that has come through is to do with the individual income tax rates, in particular pay as you earn. The threshold has been increased. Previously, the tax-free income, when you look at the lower band, was uh, 12,298 uh, Kenya shillings. If you convert that one to Uganda shillings, you are looking at about uh, 440,000. That was a tax-free income. Now that has been increased to Kenya shillings 24,000, which uh, when you convert to Uganda shillings, it works out to about 864. When you bring that one home in Uganda, the tax-free income is 235,000. In Kenya, you're looking at a tax-free income of now 864. You can be the judge of that in terms of the implication. Then there's been also some kind of relief in terms of still of uh, the, the thresholds where they have increased in terms of uh, what they give you as a deduction for the relief for personal, personal income tax, which has increased to 28,000 from 16,000. 
However, there's been a removal of some tax exemptions for individuals. Previously, there were some exemptions like uh, bonuses, overtime, retirement benefits for low-income employees. Most of these have been uh, adjusted and removed the exemptions. Well, I guess where they've given, uh, they've increased on the threshold, it's to still uh, not give everything. I think they have, that's why they've uh, reduced on some. Then with regard to turnover tax, previously, like we have for presumptive, we had, uh, they had a rate of, uh, of 3%. Now that has been reduced to 1%. With holding tax, there has also been changes on this, where they have expanded a scope of services liable to withholding tax, especially to do with our non-resident service providers like sales promotion, marketing, advertising, and transport. And in, uh, for transport in particular, the withholding tax rate is 20%. For Uganda, if you're a non-resident and providing transport, you pay withholding tax of 2%. But of course, uh, with the 20% in the amendment, it will exempt uh, transporters from the region. They will not pay this withholding tax. Then there's been an increase in the withholding tax rates uh, for dividends payable to non-residents from 10% to 15%. Previously, it was 10%. For Uganda, it was, it is 15%. However, it is reduced if we have a double taxation agreement, most of them to 10%. Now for Kenya, they are increasing it from 10 to 15%. That is for dividends. And then there's been a, an introduction of a withholding tax for non-residents when they provide reinsurance. Uh, and this, uh, the rate uh, is 5%. For Uganda, if you have to compare the same, the rate is 10% for reinsurance premiums. Then there's also been a change in the taxable value for VAT, or VAT on petroleum products. You're looking at, say, oils and those other products uh, to do with the, the petroleum. Because previously, they were excluding the other fees in availing this product, like excise duty and other charges. So the base now will include excise duty, fees, and other charges before you compute the VAT on these petroleum products, meaning that uh, the price or the cost will have to, to go up. When it comes to the other change for VAT, there's been a reduction in the time in which you apply for VAT to be refunded for budgets from five to four years. In Uganda, it is two years, so still Kenya is doing well. So it is something to look at maybe to our change claim that budget when it comes to VAT. And overall, there's been changes in the rating for the VAT items in terms of zero rating, exempt, and standard rated. Maybe just uh, one thing that catches the eye is to do with the PPE. The PPE with regard to VAT that is the personal protective equipment, which includes a face mask used by medical personnel and uh, the public. These will be exempt from VAT. So I think it's in line with, uh, with what is happening currently in the world. So briefly, that is all for VAT. The others are to do with changes in the listed items under the exempt zero and standard rated regime. Those ones you can get the details depending on what you're doing. With regard to excise duty, there has also been changes in terms of uh, the fees to do with the uh, fees uh, financial institutions. There has also been uh, exemptions. 
there's been also introduction of exercise duty on some imports like glass imported. There's been um, a, a number of changes to do with, uh, with exercise duty, but these we can get the details when we share with you the details of the changes from Kenya. With regard to maybe the tax procedure code, there's also been uh, some changes. And one of the key ones is the requirement for the commissioner to respond to a private ruling when you make an application within 60 days. When you let that one to Uganda, there's no time period which is uh, indicated beyond which the tax authority is supposed to respond back when it comes to an application for a private ruling. I guess many of us have uh, experienced this. You, it may take a year or two when they are still uh, not decided on this, but at least it helps if uh, the time is uh, spelled out, which gives guidance. Because at times you ask for a private ruling so that you have comfort before you invest. But if you don't get this or before you make a decision, it really sort of disorganizes the whole arrangement that you had planned or that you want to do. So this is a welcome move where they have designated a period where the tax authority is supposed to respond. Then the other measure has been maybe increasing the fees for whistleblowers that is on the side of Kenya. And then of course we have the fiscalization, the digital taxing where they are going to have to now appoint agents in Uganda as you've heard. They're just, uh, just getting on board and they've uh, selected the, the taxpayers who are going to start running with this. And of course, the legislation that has come through is to put in place and to operationalize the fiscalization. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is where we are ending. And especially, you can case in point what is happening now. So the fiscalization is true and to, is something that to look at. And in, in Kenya, they also. Uh, in Kenya, they also now just uh, farming up on their on their fiscalization rules. So briefly, this is the uh, overall uh, or the changes that we have from uh, Kenya, and uh, all you can do is try to relate them to Uganda. They are not very far off, but of course, when it comes to some changes, you feel like uh, our neighbors are doing more to support. Uh, especially when it comes to the tax bans which have been uh, reduced. And uh, well, the exemptions, some of the exemptions and the policies they are planning. So briefly, this is what is happening in the neighborhood. So I'll uh, take you back to the chair and then he, he guides us on the next uh, proceedings. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are all lessons we are picking from COVID. Remember, those of you who have been attending our seminars will now be clapping for Sarah and uh, Martin. But we are unable to do that. I believe we can do that within our, our hearts. We apologize for the slides. Uh, those slides, Martin's slides in particular, will be shared along uh, with Sarah's once we, we, we conclude with the with the webinar. So members, just bear with us uh, on that. We have a couple of questions. We may not be in position to answer all the questions, but like I said at the beginning, we shall be, as the Institute, we shall be constructing what we call frequently asked questions. And in the frequently asked questions, as a COVID, uh, COVID prepared document, we're going to have a specific section that will handle tax related matters. And the basis will be automatically on some of these questions that members have, have raised here. So my panelists, Sarah and Martin, I, I think I'll quickly look through some of the questions that you had shared earlier, and then uh, you will choose. Um, Sarah, you choose what you would respond to. Martin, you choose what you would respond to. I may not treat them in verbatim, just for purposes of uh, saving time. There is a very contentious question on donations to the COVID fund. Members and the public out there is wondering whether if a company makes this donation, 
the donation will be uh, allowable deduction. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody was wondering that uh, they have missed the deadline for filing for an objection because of the lockdown. What should they do? Then somebody is here, they wish to lodge a complaint. They wish to go to the tax, the tax appeals tribunal, and they wish to be guided on how they can do that within this period we are in. Somebody has raised an issue here that uh, whereas they were working for an entity, their contracts were temporarily terminated. They were working for an entity, their contracts were temporarily terminated because of uh, uh, inability, I think, to continue paying workers. But as a result, the directors decided to, to give all staff a small subsistence contribution that targeted uh, meals and some other basics. So the question is, will this be exempt from pay as, as you earn or not? Somebody wants to be guided on the VAT implications of uh, write down or scrapping of stock. And then somebody would wish to be guided on what is the tax point in matters of withholding tax. Uh, Sarah and Martin would pick on that batch first and then we move on to the next set. We begin with Martin. Uh, thank you, Charles. I hope I've uh, captured uh, most of them, but I think you had shared something as well. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, are donations to the COVID-19 fund exempted in the filing of tax returns? I think, uh, I believe this is coming with the background of the fact that this person would want to see a deduction allowed when they're computing their corporation tax. As far as uh, the law is, is currently, and for the implementers, that is uh, the URA, they cannot go outside the law to, to allow something which has not been specifically catered for in the law. So uh, the way the law is currently, you cannot get a deduction don't, for the donations. The only donations that are allowed if they are to an exempt organization, and an exempt organization must have written ruling from the tax authority that's an exempt organization. Maybe now, the thing that is, that is to be looked at is to engage the tax authority through the Ministry of Finance since it was an appeal, and this is uh, something which is unprecedented, where you can ask through maybe some kind of uh, request to be allowed a deduction for this expense, if you can demonstrate and prove that you actually incurred this expense. It is something to be followed up, which I guess, uh, we need to be maybe authorized through dialogue with the tax authority together with Ministry of Finance, because it's something which is, uh, well, it has never happened and it's what it is. So leave and at there in tax reliefs, that is okay. Then the next one was to do with, with uh, the due debts. My tax return is due soon. What should I do? I think um, Sarah hinted on this and uh, shared uh, the updates in the COVID uh, situation. The tax authority came up with uh, guidance on uh, during COVID where they extended the due dates for filing. That is uh, before the end of April. 
And uh, this has still subsequently been amended depending on your accounting period. There are those who are supposed to file, for instance, uh, final returns. There are those who are supposed to file the monthly. Yeah. So like you find those, for instance, uh, for April 15th, it has been extended to 31st of May. That is for the monthly. Then those who are supposed to file the final returns, it has been extended to September. So you need to look at the guidelines and see where you fall, and then you take, uh, you make use of that, even the payments, because well, if you have money at hand, it's better than money with, that, with authority. But there is guidance on that. At the same time, Sarah also mentioned the fact that uh, there was, um, there was uh, uh, an amnesty if you declared and paid by end of April. Of course, that was with the expectation that probably in May, uh, the lockdown would be sort of like uh, stopped. But unfortunately, it's still on. So I understand uh, that the tax authority is looking at case by case, whereby if you have a liability, you can uh, tender in your request. And uh, I believe, and I've been uh, told that you should be able to get uh, an exemption from penalty and interest. But they'll be looking at this on a case by case basis. Then uh, due to the lockdown, realize missed the deadline of filing. I think that one is done. Uh, then I have an ongoing case at the tax appeals tribunal, which is due for hearing or mention what will happen. I think that Touch also gave some guidelines on this on when uh, they closed. I think for, for, for this one, I guess, is to look at what guidelines that uh, the, the appeals tribunal put up in this period and then seeing them through and trying to make contact with them because in the absence of sitting, I mean, if they can't practice, then nothing can happen. And uh, you take it as a default that they would extend uh, the dates of the hearing. Of course, that goes to the next one. How can I file an appeal during this period? Then uh, if the employer provides extra payments, uh, someone says the entity was working an entity and a subsidy. Well, unfortunately, irrespective of uh, saying, okay, it's the situation, but it remains a fact that this is employment income. And the laws are clear. So if it's employment income, this so-called small subsidy to be taxable. The only thing they will do to the employer is, okay, you pay this subsidy and you're supposed to collect tax. Maybe you don't pay it now, like they have indicated on the COVID guidelines, pay it later. Or going through an MOU, which is maybe um, uh, convenient for you to pay, but you not be exempt from tax from this small subsidy. So I've handled some, I think up to, Sarah, if you, uh, up to eight of uh, the list of questions, you can pick up from there. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I, I don't know if I've, I can remember all, but I have listed some. I just wanted to, to give a, a clarification on TAT. I understand that, uh, of course, of course, what is happening in TAT is that uh, in line with the government guidelines on COVID, all the, all the legal entities of government are not having any cases, but it is done on a case by case. But however, if, if it is really urgent, the registrar will give just urgent orders. That is on TAT. And then somebody was saying, what do I do with an appeal during this period? You can, you can submit your appeal during this period. And what is very important is if it is online, make sure you have uh, a confirmation of receipt. Because you remember, like I was saying, URA also receives things online. So you send them the, the, the submissions online, then they should be able to stamp and put the received stamp and share with you copies with the received stamp. But uh, I'm sure for that, you may have to find your way You can still do it the same way, it's okay. Uh, there was a question on, uh, on um, VAT right of, 
on stock. A, a write-off on stock will happen because of a number of issues. Maybe it could be floods or destruction or expiry, whatever reason, whatever reason would happen. But uh, usually the key issue is that if it is VAT, there will be input tax that you incurred in respect to this stock, which you want to claim a, a, credit, a credit on. So you, you will have to confirm that the, the reasons for the write-off and then uh, support documentation to confirm that VAT was paid on in respect to this stock. And then maybe some, some documentation by the business confirming that write-off, maybe minutes of the write-off. And uh, if it was a, uh, if it was expiry or destruction of stock, usually what happens is that you have to invite the tax authority to come and inspect and they will give you an inspection certificate and that will help you to get a credit for this input tax that you incurred on stock. Uh, there was a question on the VAT, sorry, tax point for withholding tax. What I know is that for withholding tax, uh, the tax point specifically for interest is a, uh, payment. When you are paying, you withhold. But the rest, it's supposed to be on accrual or provision. But of course, it, it becomes very difficult from a practical perspective to withhold when you have not really paid. So it is, it is a contentious issue, but in terms of the legal framework, the law still talks of a clarity only on interest, but the others like dividends, if you accrue dividends, you propose, once you propose and they are in the financials, you have to pay the withholding tax there, 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 even when you have not actually paid out the dividend. So the same would apply to the others, royalties, ETC, management fees, ETC. But the practicability of doing that makes it very difficult. So many people just withhold on payment. But... Uh, you will note that sometimes the tax authority is also flexible, but there are instances when they are really tight and they will want you to pay late payment interest where you waited until you paid to, to, to withhold. Uh, there, there, there was a question which I got earlier. Somebody said they left their desktop at, at office and they couldn't file the Uh, to pay the tax. You can do the PRN and pay the tax and then you can write to the tax authority for that, that waiver like the way Martin has indicated with the, the e-tax now is that when, when, when something is not in the system, the system automatically will compute the interest, late payment interest. But if you are able to write and explain they could consider, especially if you are able to pay. You may not have filed the return, but have you been able to pay? That is also very key. Thank you, Martin. I don't know if I've left out some questions. Maybe we can take them to the next round, if time permits. Over to Charles. Uh, sure. That's Maybe I've that's yes, Martin? Okay, I've just seen some, some from, the, from the chat. Yes, sure. Where someone indicated that... Uh, he got a default message after they, have, they had filed their return late. What that person can do is to write back to services and refer to the COVID guidance uh, notice from URA. So that is also on record. And later on, when it, it, it comes to say audit, you are able to defend yourself not to be penalized for not having filed the return. And maybe to just uh, clarify, for these COVID guidelines uh, uh, from URA, they are to do mainly with returning, not payment, because there's penalty for failure to return by the due date, and then there's penalty for failure to pay by the due date. Ready? You look at them critically, they are to do with returning. So don't be caught in between. You need to run around with that. And then someone indicated that this uh, person didn't think account and needed to be allowed to drive their cars to their offices. Peter, help me well, mute Ambrose. I don't know if you, you are the, the, the essential people, but uh, I guess 
it's a it's a tricky one like lawyers lawyers are only allowed 30 though of course in, in reality depending on where business calls you have to appear wherever but at the same time we need to think outside um, because i guess many of us now have been able to work from home we are doing these presentations online so it is something that where where we need now to think outside the norm we are embracing e-returns, e-tax, e-receipts, e-payments. Yeah. Legislation is coming to do with uh, the receipting. So that physical appearance, we need to rethink through it in terms of how we provide our services, irrespective of the culture and I being used to having to drive to office. Back to you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Sarah and uh, members. We still have some time members who are, who are in. We are going to give chance to those uh, who wish to, to be heard, who wish to ask their questions. But probably before we do that, let's just have another batch of about two, four or five questions or from the chat. Uh, my sister Maureen is seeking clarity. If an organization presents a and I present a VAT exempt certificate to a supplier of vertical service. Does this imply that they should not be billed? They should be billed without VAT. Then uh, we've already talked about the donations. Uh, some members are commenting about our policy recommendations to the government. That is uh, very handy, that is very, uh, good to note that people are reading those recommendations. I just encourage each one of you to really take note of that. Uh, Guma seeks clarity on uh, the impact of doing business in terms of tax relief uh, between zero rated suppliers and exempt suppliers for that purposes. Uh, those of you who have noticed the typos in uh, the presentation, they, they were just typos. We shall address that, those before we share with you. Uh, we thank you for being observant. Uh, somebody is raising a comment on, uh, on uh, the pay relief for three months. Uh, he's picking this from uh, the proposals that uh, ICPAO submitted to government. Maybe just to comment on that. We addressed that in the spirit of uh, ensuring that businesses uh, are given ample time to manage their cash flows adequately. If I am supposed to pay a tax next week, and probably you give me three more weeks, we are saying that would do help me in, in shaping and managing that cash flow, my cash flows. That is the spirit in which that proposal was. Uh, was raised. Uh, there is someone who wished to be guided uh, on what status for hotels. Uh, what does it mean for an NGO using hotels for its staff while in the field? Somebody seeks uh, clarity on that. And uh, probably the last one that uh, you may not have uh, addressed, Sarah and Martin, is the other issue of somebody whose contracts were temporarily terminated and they were given subsistence, employee subsistence, contribution, words, meals, and other basic uh, necessities. Their argument was that uh, employment income arises from where uh, we have employer employee relationship. And where we have terminated the contract, they seem to believe that uh, Section 19.6 does not uh, guide such uh, an activity. So they wish to get some clarity from you in instances where the contract has been terminated, but uh, somebody has extended the subsistence help in form of money value automatically, will they go ahead and uh, a charge pairs and Sarah Martin over to you. Sarah, do you want to take the first three 
or we can uh, substantiate on any or what do you propose okay okay let me take the first three then you'll come on the others <coughs> uh this one on the vat exempt certificate for vertebral service um we have exemptions for specific services like especially to the hydroelectric uh, power generating companies and also to to donor funded projects by government and uh, you you will note that when you are when you are providing services there you will not put vat on it but uh, what what members need to understand is that i can be dealing in uh, an exempt supply or i can be dealing in taxable supplies and then say for example an ngo comes to purchase goods from me i will sell the supply and charge vat depending on the nature of that supply in the vat act if that supply attracts tax or vat then you will purchase including vat the ability of that purchaser to claim the VAT or not, again, will depend on the type of supplies that they deal in. So that, that is exactly how it plays. But uh, we also have what we call deemed VAT, which government introduced because of cash flow problems. That if you are providing uh, services to a donor funded project, the VAT is deemed to have been paid. So you would, you would actually file your invoice you would you would submit the invoice with VAT but when they are paying you they will only pay without VAT and they, they return takes care of that and then the number two was the impact of doing business when dealing in zero rated or exempt I actually tried to bring this out when you deal in zero rate zero rate actually is an incentive that government puts across for people to to benefit if you deal exclusively in zero rate, like for example, exporters or people dealing in international transportation, like for example, Uganda Airlines, those are exclusive, exclusively zero rated supplies. And they are normally in a net refund position. Whatever VAT they incur in purchasing supplies, maybe rent, uh, electricity, water, purchasing consumables, purchasing capital goods, they, they, they are able to claim all that VAT if they are in zero rated business or they deal in zero rated supplies. The difference with the exempt is that you are not even supposed to register for VAT when you deal in exempt. Meaning now that if I deal in exempt supplies, I go downtown to purchase goods, I would still be able to purchase goods and the VAT is embedded within that cost. The difference is that I will not be able to claim the refund of that uh, VAT. It will be part of my cost of doing business. So, but when I'm in exempt, uh, when I'm in zero rate, I am able to, to, to distinguish between, between uh, the cost of the good and VAT. The VAT will go into the VAT ledger, then I'm able to claim that refund from URA. Then, but for, for exempt, the cost and VAT will be one and the same and it will hit my P&L and affect my margins. Number three is VAT on hotels. Remember we said that government proposes to have a VAT exemption for upcountry hotels and this is really a welcome note for, for hotel businesses. Remember they are the worst hit. Most of the staff working in these hotels have really lost their jobs and so they will not be having VAT if you are located up country. If an NGO staff goes to sleep in that hotel, it means that the cost will be much lower because there will be no VAT. VAT will not be there, it will be much lower. Like again, the way it said, exemption is not entirely as cheap as it looks. It will not wipe away the 18% entirely because there are also costs that will be incurred by this hotel to, to provide those services. They will not be able to claim all that VAT, but it will be part of the cost of their business. So the, you, you will expect that maybe the, the, the per night bill will be relatively lower compared to the previous period. I, I will leave Martin to handle the others. I think it is one or two more. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Just to emphasize the point of VAT in terms of doing business, you are better off if you are dealing with a zero one standard than exempt. Because when you are dealing with exempt, this is that they call a cascading effect. Because that VAT you are not able to transfer it. It becomes a cost to you and part of your expenses. So whereas some people at times clamor for exemption, it's really not a good alternative. So you need to think through it in terms of doing business. Someone asks for a payment where it's a Uh, what we indicated for the interventions by the tax authority and uh, during this uh, period is they've come up with guidelines. And for instance, if you had uh, an MOU, they encourage you to reschedule because if you had payments which are due during this period, they indicated that you can reschedule. And if you don't have, and you are just going into one, and in this case, you're not able to pay. The key thing is, what they listed there is indicating that you've been affected by COVID. If you can demonstrate that in whatever means, then you should be able to have a, uh, your case handled and probably give you an extension for you to make the payment. So you do case by case and uh, don't sit back. You can contact, uh, you can use the services uh, email to get your aid to make this because what you need is documentation. Because uh, when these people come to audit and they don't see anything, you don't have anything to demonstrate that you've tried and you failed and also to support your cause. Then uh, someone indicated uh, the contracts which were terminated and they got a subsistence contribution. We had uh, responded to this, but just to emphasize the fact that uh, this subsistence contribution is not exempt from tax. When you look at how they define uh, employment income, it includes even what you've called a subsistence contribution. Because among us, the definition of what, cont what, uh, what uh, composes of employment income, they even call other allowances, and also includes, for instance, any amount derived as compensation for termination of any contract of employment, whether provision was made for it or not. All these is really capture such payments. So this will be taxable. The only thing is uh, for the employer who is supposed to pay tax on them can ask for deferral of making that payment. Then someone in the chat indicated uh, budget and uh, COVID in terms of uh, Missy catch payment is subject to okay. Also guided you are will give an extension. Maybe um, someone who raised the issue of uh, an objection where is let you can ask for your period to be extended to raise an objection and don't sit back. You can do the mail and ask for this, apply for this online and you will get an extension so that uh, they extend your period which raise an objection even if the days have expired. So please don't test it. You go ahead and, uh, and apply for this. You will get the extension allowed. I think those were the questions that came through. And maybe just to clarify on the issue of um, withholding tax in terms of the tax point, for withholding taxes on gross payments and then they say on the payment, yeah? Now, when they look at uh, the definition of payment, payment includes even amounts payable. Meaning, like, you are supposed to account for withholding tax technically, for as long as you have paid or you have not paid for as long as you've been, uh, sort of, you have an invoice for withholding tax. Though in practice, at times, the tax authority is not so, vigilant in trying to enforce the bit of payable where some people have accounted for it when they have paid the tax. But it is supposed to be accounted for when the amount becomes payable because the definition for payment includes amounts payable. So that is it for now. Back to Charles. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much, Sarah.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of our webinar, of today's webinar. But it will not be fair if we left without hearing a word from some of you who are attending. I just want to give an opportunity to three people. And I request that if you're given the opportunity, please be brief and to the point, because we need to clock out uh, by four o'clock. Timothy, your hand has been uh, up from the beginning. I, I believe you're still there. Please, Timothy, we shall give you the first opportunity to ask. Uh, Grace, if you're still there, uh, CPA Grace Nyadoi, you take the second opportunity. And then uh, Nobat, uh, Nobat, is Nobat still there? Uh, we can give it to Mark, Mark Kaziwe, the third opportunity. Uh, Peter, uh, please give uh, Timothy. Uh, you can unmute Timothy to air out his question. Uh, Timothy. Timothy, we don't have much time. Uh, Peter, could we go to Grace? Grace Nadoy, are you there? Uh, I think we can't. Uh, Mark is on. Hello. Yes, Peter. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, please. And presentation. Yes, go ahead. Please be brief. Uh, could, you, could you please share uh, with us the slides on our emails for the presentations? The slides we indicated will be shared at the end of the, 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 the webinar. Do you have any question? Thanks. Okay, have a welcome. great day. You're welcome. Uh, Peter, could we move to Silva? Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Sarah and Martin. My question is uh, very simple. We are talking of e-invoicing, yes, which sir. should be coming in with the new amendments. Could you by any chance be knowing if the system is already being pre-tested such that uh, when it comes in, it does not give us uh, give people a lot of headache, given that now, as it looks, most of the deductions allowable will be hinged on invoices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silva. Crispus, are you there? Uh, Crispus? Yes, hello? Yes. Yes, I would like to ask uh, uh, from Sarah's presentation, he started on uh, on uh, income tax and allowances, uh, and he showed us the difference with the, if you're investing in the city and when you're investing up country. I would like to know if I'm improving my investment and I'm still in the city uh, setup, do I still qualify for those allowances at the same time? Okay, thank you so much, Chris Pass. Uh, as I let the panelists to respond to those questions, Peter just uh, give us a screen about the upcoming events uh, so that members who are interested do not miss out on those events. Uh, remember, at the end of the year, we shall need to return to make our CPD returns and uh, the Institute as usual is doing whatever it can to make sure that you, you have these events. We shall be running the COVID-19 
implications for internal auditors, key considerations on uh, 22nd of May. So internal auditors in the house, I pray that you take note of that. But before that, on the 19th, we shall have demonstrating leadership in a time of crisis. And here we shall be looking at key audit and assurance considerations. That will be on the 19th of May. I pray that uh, members keep checking your mails because we keep making these communications and share with you uh, the links. In case you find any trouble, uh, feel free to write back to us and we shall be uh, helpful. As Sarah and uh, Martin, in conclusion, we had uh, the last two questions. Okay, let me respond to the one of invoicing. Sarah will respond to the one of uh, the incentives. Sure. With regard to the e invoicing, it is still a work in progress. And as of now, they selected uh, the companies and the tax authority has made presentations to them where they want to pilot with this. And I believe all this will be done in terms of pretesting and where you can even run concurrently your system because it's an integration where the tax authority should be able to see, for instance, your sales, then to also approve, for instance, the receipts and the rest. Because where it's heading, what they are looking at eventually is, uh, for instance, when it comes to VAT, is they'll be looking at uh, the receipts that have been approved by the tax authority. Because in there, there'll be an approval. For those who are tech survey, they know what it is at the back office at your A and then it will be approved before it is released. So, like it will ease the whole process, but it's not such it's going to just uh, cut across immediately. They, for, for starters, they made presentation to given companies and uh, we believe they go through all this procedure of pre-testing to see how it works. Though, of course, we can't rule out the fact of uh, the tax authority at times imposing some things. Like if you've been following what has been happening, they put a deadline for, like for instance, the digital stamps where they blackmail the manufacturing establishments, which were supposed to do to install the digital stamps. And uh, of course, they suffered in terms of uh, not being, for instance, on the exemption list, but it was it is what it was. And also you saw when uh, the uh, self-assessment came through, they had a cutoff. So you just have to be ready for this because um, what will happen is they'll say, okay, invoice has been, has been tested. The law is there, we've run it with these companies. Now we have a cutoff. So if you're not prepared, you may lose out. So you just have to plan around it, prepare at least on your side, to make sure that you are doing the invoicing so that when this comes up, you just integrate with that tax authority guidelines and uh, you run with it. Yeah, that's my submission. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Sarah, in uh, the next three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, <clears throat> on, on the investment, the conditions will apply. Remember, I talked of additional capital. If you are able to invest additional capital of $300 million, $300,000, uh, that would be fine within Kampala. And then also, remember in terms of, of employing citizens and then the wage bill. If you are able to meet those conditions, then that portion of the investment will be exempt. But the, 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 the earlier investment won't be exempt. So you will see yourself doing uh, some segmental reporting for tax purposes maybe the additional project will have its own reporting of income and expenses, and then there will be no tax to that effect. Then this other old project will continue paying tax. Thank you very much for, for your time, and back to you, Charles. Uh, just uh, before Charles uh, comes in, just on that other investment, yes, they've tried to come up with a formula to try and uh, cater for this. So just yeah, yeah. look at uh, the amendment so that uh, you are able to to know how it applies because it brings into effect the old, the new in terms of revenue. 
So just take an interest in the formula and then apply that. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we have much time uh, from now. Uh, just allow me to thank you people for your time, for dedicating your time to follow up on the activities that we have. I simply call upon you again to book for activities that we share with you. You can follow us up on LinkedIn at ICPAO at ICPAU1. You can follow us up on Facebook. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of uh, developments that we share with you on those different platforms. What you need to keep at hand is that uh, the Institute will keep updating you of the developments. We have a specifically designed uh, a menu on the Institute's website. COVID-19 has resources that I believe members will be interested in. There are a number of questions that you ask and we have assembled a lot of resources that could help you uh, respond to those uh, concerns. Our members who have, who have raised up their hands, I can see my council member, I can see my sister Sheila. You know when you are distributing posho, at times uh, if you are distributing posho in your village, you make sure you skip your family, you sacrifice your family and show that you care for the others. You will pardon me for that, but uh, next time probably we shall have more time to share and discuss. I thank you all. I thank Peter, our IT, and our panelists. I thank you, Peter, ladies and gentlemen. Keep safe. Thank you, too. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. It was just accidental. I didn't even expect that I was going to call my name. Then one of these. Hey, Fear.